great, great time of praise and worship. Amen. God is an amazing God and he deserves everything that we can give him and, and even more. Today I want you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Jeremiah chapter 12. We're going to be reading just one verse. Uh, it's going to be verse 5. Now I want you to hold on to that because we're not actually going to read it right now. Uh, as I shared in the first service today, we're basically going to have sermon A and sermon B uh, so I'm going to give you part of the sermon A now, and then we'll get into our text with sermon B. Uh, they're all one sermon, so I don't want you to get discouraged thinking, man, you're going to be here all day because you're, you're not, I promise. We'll get you out on time. But what I wanted to talk about today is, is again, a very difficult, uh, message. I, as a matter of fact, I've struggled, uh, with this message for a couple of weeks now. And even getting ready to, to preach it uh, over uh, this weekend has been kind of a heavy burden on me because I, I, I want to be very careful. And this is especially one of those where I pray every Sunday, Lord, let my words be your words. I don't, I don't want this to be me. I want this to be God speaking. Because we're going to be looking today at a very difficult uh, uh, idea about with the church and what I wanted to do is, is I wanted to praise the Lord because again this morning, as I was still struggling, I got up this morning early and did my quiet time. And as, as many as you, uh, I hope, are doing, we're reading through our Bible in a year, which we try to do here at First Baptist West every year. Well, this year I'm doing a chronological uh, order style Bible reading. And that's where things as they were happening in the Old Testament rather than just the way we've arranged them. And it was, and that God knew that I was struggling. And so what was really cool is today when I got up to do my quiet time, inside my quiet time, just in chronological order, just on this date when I was supposed to be reading it anyway, this was part of my text. And it was almost like God said, well, it was like God saying, you're okay. Preach this message. And because again, this was my text. And so what I want to look at today is with the idea that reminded me is when I was a coach. As many of you know, or many of you at home know, that I, uh, I coached girls basketball and was a public school teacher for 17 years before I became a full-time pastor. And every year as we were getting the season, getting close to getting it underway, we'd been having a lot of practices, a lot of things going on. I would always arrange for a couple of scrimmages. Now, what the scrimmage would be was that we would bring groups in and we would scrimmage. And what we would do is that way I, as a coach, could look and see how are we doing? Are we, are we in close? And was there something that I needed to do differently over the next week or two to get us even more ready for when the season actually started? And so there were times that I would look and I'd say, okay, my team is in pretty good shape. We're, getting, we're ready. We're ready for the season to start. But then there were times that I would look and say, boy... We have some work to do. And then I would go back in and I would take those things from the scrimmages and I would apply them into my practices so that I would get my team ready for when the actual competition would start. And I'm, my friends, today I believe that the church is being tested. I believe we are being tested with all the, the situations that are going on across our nation and around our world. I believe the church is being tested to see, are we ready? And that's the title of my message today, are we ready? And so are we ready for what? Are we ready for the tribulations that I believe that are coming to the church? Not just First Baptist West, but I mean the church in America. Because we, we look around and we see the way things are going. And I would have to dare say that I, with, with the response that I'm seeing all across our nation through the tweets and the Facebooks and all the different things that are going on, I really am beginning to wonder, are we ready for tribulations? Are we really ready for things to, quote, get bad for the church? Because I believe the church is going to go through tribulation times. Because I believe that Satan wants to move across America, and I believe he's doing it. Amen? But can I share something with you that I truly believe? Satan cannot move across America when the church is in his way. The church, listen to me, the church is a powerful entity. And in order for Satan to move like he wants, he needs the church to be weakened. And Satan's goal, listen to me, is to divide the church 
so that we'll not be that strong, powerful entity. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us in Matthew 16 to 18, he was talking to Peter, and he says, And I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What Jesus told Peter, he said, Now, Peter, you're not going to be the the, the you're not going to be what the Satan cannot conquer. But your testimony, me being Jesus, me being God's son, me being the savior of the world, that I will build upon that testimony. And that testimony that is built is going to be called the church. And the church is going to be such a powerful entity. He says, even the gates of hell cannot prevail against this thing we call the church. He can't do it. We are a powerful entity, but listen to me. We are only going to be as powerful as long as we are united by God's Spirit. If we become divided, which is what Satan is wanting, we will become weak. And if we become weak, Satan will be able to prevail. But when we are the church, we are united by God's Spirit. We cannot be overtaken. And I believe Satan is doing that today. I believe he's trying to divide the church. And you know what I, I, I've been amazed by? Satan has been able to divide the church with this little piece of cloth. It has amazed me how this little piece of cloth has been used as a tool by Satan to divide the church. Now, you're here, you may be listening at home, and I, I want to tell you this this sermon today is not a sermon pro-mask. Now, don't get excited if you're anti-mask because I'm going to tell you this sermon is not an anti-mask. As a matter of fact, can I be so bold to tell you that right here standing on this pulpit today, this is the last thing I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about the power of the church. I'm concerned about the unifying spirit of, for this church at First Baptist West, but for churches around America. So if you're sitting here thinking and you either shut me out or you're angry because I'm already talking for or against the mask, my friend, you're already listening to Satan because it has nothing, nothing, nothing to do with this mask, but the unifying spirit of God working through the church. That's how we're powerful. Is by being unified together. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us in the book of John, chapter 17, verse 20 and 21, says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Listen to me. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. Listen, that they also may be one in us. Why? That the world might believe that you sent me. It is by the testimony and the power and the unifying spirit of the church that the lost world is even going to know that Jesus was sent by God. Because without the powerful testimony of the church, we are just like everybody else. And we might as well say Jesus is the same as Muhammad. We might as well say Jesus is the same as Buddha. We might as well say Jesus is the same as anything else out there. It is by the testimony of the power of the unifying church through the Holy Spirit of God powerfully making us so powerful that we cannot uh, be, be stood against. It is by that that people are going to believe in Jesus. And that's why, listen to me, that's why Satan doesn't want the church to be unified. That's why he wants us pick, bickering and fighting and fussing and disputing over such trivial things. So in our text today, that's sermon, that's sermon A. Let's get to sermon B now. Because in our text, God is going to be addressing the very same thing right here that I'm talking about today. In Jeremiah chapter 12, starting at verse 1, Jeremiah is complaining about the evilness of the world. He's complaining about how the evil prosper and, oh, he's so tired of it. And, man, these little things and calling him names, they're saying bad things about him. They're, they're, they're just fussing and fighting. And, and he says, oh, God, how long? How long are you going to let this? Oh, God, I'm being tortured. Oh, God, I'm being this. And, God, I'm being that. And here's God's response. 
in Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 5. And I believe that this is the same thing that God does. He is looking at the church of today. And as he's watching us scrimmage, he's wondering, are we ready for what's lying ahead of us? Because this little thing is dividing the church, not just at West, but I mean everywhere. It's dividing us into these factions that I do not believe God is blessing. And he asks this question. Let's stand in honor of reading God's word this morning. He says in verse 5, after all this complaining, verses 1 through 4, now it's God's time to talk. He says, if you have run with the footmen and they are weary, they have wearied you, then how can you contend with the horses? And if the land of peace in which you trusted, if they wearied you, then how will you be able to do in the floodplains of the Jordan? Father, hear our prayers today. Take this message and use it as you desire. And Father, I pray that this will not be my words, but these words will be yours. I pray, Father, that the message will not be my message, but the message you have given me. And that, Father, the response would be as you desire for it to be in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. So God basically asked two questions. When Jeremiah is saying, oh, it's so bad, oh, it's so tough... God looked at him and he asked him, he said, if you're frustrated now, if you are weary now, if you are divided now over these issues, if this is what's going to divide you, what are you going to do when things get tough? So he talks about basically a foot race. He says, if you're frustrated here, how will you run out there? If this is tearing you apart, what are you going to do when it really gets tough? And he says, it's a foot race. It's basically familiar. It's, it's, it's that scrimmage. It's the stuff that we call persecution. Hey, can I, can I tell you something? I want to make a declaring, state, declaring statement right now. Can I tell you the churches in America do not know what it's like to be persecuted? We know what it's like to be inconvenienced. And he says... Church, not First West only, but I mean churches. If you are struggling when you're inconvenienced, what are you going to do when you get into the big race? These are foot races we're running. These are the scrimmages. These are the prep times for days that I believe that are coming one day. He said, if you're that way in a familiar place, what are you going to do? With the second one, the horse race. He said, man, when you get against those that are powerful, when you get against those that are trained to to bring separation, to bring persecution, what are you going to do then? If 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 you're struggling now, you're going to really struggle when it comes time. He says, you're struggling now, and this is not tough. And those immortal words of Bachman Turner Overdrive back in the 70s, If you think this is tough, if you think this is bad, baby, you ain't seen nothing yet. Amen? That's what he's telling Jeremiah. You think it's tough? What are you going to do when you have to run with the big guys? Church, what are you going to do when it really gets tough? He said, you got a horse race here. And there's, can I tell you, church, there's a horse race coming. Now, If you don't know, and many of you do because you asked me before you even called me here, but any new members or any of you at home that are listening, I am a premillennialist. What that means is, that's a fancy word for saying that I believe the rapture is going to take place before the tribulation comes. I believe that. I believe in the rapture. Amen. And I believe it's going to come. The church is not going to endure the great tribulation. Now, here's where I sometimes take a little bit of a, a beating, a pounding whenever I declare that because I got these people going, oh, well, then you think the church is going to be fine right up until the, the, the great tribulation. No, I don't. Because here, let me share something with you. The Bible describes the great tribulation, which I believe the church will not go through. It describes it as a time of persecution that has never been seen before. And will never be seen again. That means that the the prophets in the Old Testament. The apostles in the New Testament. 
that it's going to be worse than they dealt with. That's how bad the tribulation is going to be. So even as a premillennialist, I believe that the church is going to have some very difficult times. Because even if it's as bad as the apostles got, folks, that's bad. So we are, according to Scripture, going to face some very difficult times in the future. The church will go through more than mild inconveniences. We're going to go through some tribulation before the great tribulation. We won't be a part of that, but do not, do not think that we're going to miss out. Because I believe there's things already in play that are bringing possibility of the great tribulation happening. Very quickly. Which means then there's going to be levels, I believe, of persecutions for the church before we get there. So if you think this is bad, baby, you ain't seen nothing yet. I don't mean this to be a downer. I mean for this to be a positive because God says, listen, the church is powerful enough to overcome that. If we stay unified. I hear people say, well, then we're, we're being we're being tortured. It's like it was in the book of Daniel. Can I let me let me pause just a second. I want to read from the book of Daniel a couple of times here in Daniel chapter three, verses 14 and 15. It says Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them. Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship this golden image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready, at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, the the symphony of all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But you, if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning fiery furnace, and wherein who is the God who will deliver you? From the hands. Now folks that's persecution. You either bow down or die. I don't recall anyone giving me that choice this morning. Amen. Were any of you confronted before you stepped into First Baptist West and said oh. Hey if you walk into that building and you sing those praise songs. When you come out of this building, you're going to die. I don't think we were given that yet. Amen? Amen. Daniel chapter 6. And they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any any god or man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast in the den of lions? The king answered and said... The thing is true according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. means that what I have said happens, cannot be changed even by me. He said, so they answered and said before the king, that Daniel, who is the one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you. And no king or for your decrees that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. So what they were basically saying there is Daniel is going against you. And because of that, you have already said that if they bow down before any other God besides you for 30 days, they will die. Folks, that's persecution. Do you realize there are people even in today, the year 2020, around the world that if they get caught doing what we're doing right now, they could die They would be put into prison for doing this. And we want to cry out, oh, we've been persecuted as the church. And we start fighting and fussing over a piece of cloth or other items. How are we going to be able to deal with the horses? The horses are coming, folks. The time of the horses are coming. So he asked him, if you're frustrated here, how will you run out there? Then he asked him this. He says, how will you survive the perils of this world? He says in in, in the second part of verse 5, and if the land of peace in which you trusted, they wearied you. He said, man, if, if in this time, right here, right now, in this time, if this wearies the church and divides the church, And weakens the church. What are we going to do when we get into the thickets of the world? 
He said, then how will you do the floodplains of the Jordan? Now, we think in Oklahoma, we think about floodplains, and we think of floodplains as being nice, flat land that gets flooded over every now and then. It's just a little bit of grass, maybe some trees. But Jeremiah knew what God was saying to him here. Because I want to show you a picture of uh, the floodplains. Let me get to it. There it is. That's what he's talking about. And he said, Jeremiah knew that inside of that, an enemy will hide. And you have to fight through that every single day. That's your life. Getting to the Jordan and back. Getting water and back. You go through that right there. And inside of that are lions. Men and women, men who can destroy you. And with one false step you could die in that. He said if you are struggling in the peaceful times of our nation. And you go oh no preacher these aren't peaceful times. No they're not. But I promise you, they're not this. They're not this. He said, if that wearies you, how are you going to do it in the real world? Where the enemy is hiding. Where the enemy gives you these challenges. That you either go with them or you die. Not that you alter anything. You cease doing what you're doing or you will die. He says, Jeremiah, I don't think you're ready yet. If this, in the first part of chapter 12, bothers you and wearies you, I'm not so sure you're ready for the second part, first and second part of verse 5. So we then we look and we see that if things are going to go bad, what do we do? What do we do? In Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 15 says this. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Okay, what he's saying is, hey, guess what, church? We've been made free. Amen? Never to be bound up by anything again. We are free to do whatever we choose. We're free. But he says, only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. In other words... You got the freedom, but don't take advantage of it to satisfy your, what you think, what you feel, your thoughts on everything. Folks, I've even told you before, and I've told you at home, we are not here, and this is not about us. None of this is about us. It's about God. Worship is about Him. My life is about Him. The decisions I make are about Him. But it says, but... Don't use that as an opportunity for the flesh. But listen to what he says. But through love, serve one another. You know what he's saying here? Put other people before you. Church, that's what we're about. Loving others. He says, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this. That you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Oh, I'm free to do what I want. But I shouldn't use that freedom to hurt somebody else. I shouldn't use that freedom to get my way all the time. I ought to be thinking about somebody else, my neighbor. But listen to the, listen to the last part. Listen to the last part. But, now listen, let me, let me, before I say this, you know he's not talking about the world and the church here, right? He's not talking about the world versus the church. He's talking to whom? The church. Church, you have been made free, but don't use that freedom to do your own thing, but make sure that you are loving others more than yourself. And here's where he then concludes this verse to the church. But, If you bite, <clears throat> excuse me, if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. We are free, but we should not use that freedom to go after each other. 
Because it is by doing that we will consume one another. And once we begin to consume one another, guess who's free to run rampant? Satan. He's just waiting for the church to begin to devour one another. Separating yourselves from one another over issues that really... One way or the other. Again, I don't care. I'm not talking about it. I'm talking about the unity of the church. I'm talking, I'm talking about the unity of the, the, the universal church. I was sharing just the other night with Brother Troy Taylor about this and, and sharing the thing. And he, he gave me this, basically an interpretation of that. And what he said was this. We have the freedom of opinions. Amen? Hey, United States of America, we're free. We have the right to have an opinion. Amen? Amen. And you know what I'm finding out? We all have one. We all have a bunch of them, as a matter of fact. As a matter of fact, some, thing, some people come to my office and say, I need your opinion on them. something. I go, woo! I got one. As a matter of fact, if you want more than one, I'll give you more than one opinion. Man, I got opinions running out of my face. We have the freedom of opinion. But we do not have the liberty of call, causing division in the body. You have a right for an opinion. But you have no freedom if it's going to cause division in the body. If we're going to devour each other, God says stop. If it's going to cause that much division, just stop. Because you know one thing I've found out? Listen to me at home too. I found out there's a whole lot of bigger stuff going to happen than this. The United States of America needs a powerful church. Oh, they may not want it, but they need it. Lawton needs a powerful church. We are that powerful entity only if we stay unified together. And we don't begin to devour one another. But when we do, rest assured, Satan is rubbing his hands together. His mouth begins to water because he knows he's getting ready to devour somebody. Patrick, you just mentioned it a while ago. Seeking whom he may devour. I want to close with this. Have you ever watched one of those National Geographics or Animal Kingdom type things and they talk about the lions and how they crouch and they're watching a herd? Do you remember who the lion goes after? The smallest, the weakest, the one who has separated themselves from the herd. And the lion's mouth begins to water. And he picks them out and says, That's the one I'm after, and he'll go after them. Do you know who Satan walking around looking and acting like a lion seeking whom whom he may devour? Do you know who he's going after? The church or the churches that are weak by separation and division. He will swoop in. Great civilizations have never crumbled because they've been attacked from the outside until they begin to rot from the inside and weaken. Then at certain points, the enemy says they're weak, let's take them. Can I tell you this? And I'm done, I promise. No more other things. Satan cannot destroy the church from outside. Why? The gates of hell cannot prevail against us. He won't even really go after us until we begin to rot and crumble from the inside and we become weak. Then he attacks. Can I tell you today? Look around, folks. Satan is attacking. This isn't, this isn't bad. Are we ready? 
Are we ready? First Baptist West, you at home that are part of our church, others that maybe not, that's okay. Are we ready? By looking how we're dealing with these issues today, are we ready? We better be. Because again, we ain't seen nothing yet. So here's what I want us to do. I'm going to ask the praise team to come on back up. You at home, I want you to join in with us too. As the praise team comes back up, what I want us to do is I want us to, to pray, God, am I ready? Not, not about anyone else. Please do not pray about any one other person in this place or anyone you know. Pray about you. God, am I ready? Am I ready to take this on? Am I ready to make the church stronger by my testimony, by my actions, by my words, or am I a part of the decay? God, am I ready? God, is First Baptist West ready? Are we ready? If you feel that God is speaking to you and, and you at home, you say, God's already telling you, man, you're not ready. I want to ask you first, are you not ready because you don't know Jesus as your Savior? Man, you can, you can do anything you want. You can claim anything you want. But until you call upon the name of the Lord, you will not be saved. Would you call on his name? As a matter of fact, if you're home, we have a number for you to call. Someone will be answering the phone. Call us. And we want to visit with you and pray with you about receiving Christ into your life. If you're here, we've we got people all around that want to pray with you. Would you come this morning? But if you want to, also the altars are open or home right there where you are. Just bow and pray. God, bring the church where you want us to be. Unify our spirit by pouring your spirit out on us as we are ready, oh God. We are ready to be one as you are one with him. And Lord, we want through us the world to know that, that you sent Jesus. Oh, let it be happening here at First Baptist West. That happened here. Oh, let's stand and as the praise team leads us and the altars are open, would you come?